hack into cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. all right what's up everybody welcome to the show good morning it is tuesday october 10th 2023 welcome to episode number 469 where my hair seems to get longer by the minute Oh my gosh, Matthew Necci, hot out the gate, 16 months, way to go. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you, Matthew Necci. Welcome, everybody, to Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Kimberly, back in the mod chair, B-Sex Space Tacos, Joseph Fallon, Carol Carroll, newcomers like Zach Cho, long-timers like Marcus Kyler, Ms. Julian, guys over on LinkedIn, ladies up in YouTube. Simply Cyber Squad members, community members, cybersecurity industry, first timers, long timers. Guys, we got a lot of folks here, and we're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of these stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So, how can you operationalize this at work this week, this quarter, before the end of the fiscal year, or how you can, um, you know, use it in a macro level to kind of set strategy for your next one to three years. Also, if you're looking to break into the industry, I know many of you are looking to break into the industry. I got news for you. This podcast will deliver value to you because you're going to be asked in any job interview, hey, how do you stay current in the industry? Guess what? This is a mic drop type answer where you're like, simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief Podcast, right? Mic drop. Plus the interviewer probably already knows about it. You know what I'm saying? A little elbow, elbow bumping uh, afterwards. No, believe me though, if you're paying attention, you're going to hear terminology, concepts, the networking is great. Folks over here in chat are amazing. We've got a great community and this show, in my opinion, uh, is uh, just a, a great service to the community. As a reminder, I do not prepare or research any of these stories in advance. So you're getting my raw, uh, you know, straight from the hip uh, <laughs> uh, analysis on each of these stories, which sometimes um, can be, you know, silly and sometimes it can be insightful. Uh, I'll leave it to you to decide. Hey, what's up, Jenny Housley? Good to see you. And BSEC, there it is, Tuesday. So it is Tidbits Tuesday. I will be sharing uh, a little bit about myself as I do every Tuesday. See if it resonates with you. My goodness, uh, I've got a gem of a Tidbits Tuesday for you today. So stay tuned for that. Now, before we get into the show, I want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors. Start with my good friend, Eric Taylor and Barricade Cyber. Um, at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions, they know how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. This is their website. If you do get over there and you need them for a little bit of help, scroll to the bottom. And you can see here, you can just meet Eric Taylor. You can actually have him respond to an active ransomware incident, business email compromise, whatever you need. Don't be uh, silly. Take advantage of these great services that are out there in our industry. Also want to say shout out to Panopsi Security. Get a partner who understands your cyber program. Um, G, hold on. Uh, Joseph Michelle saying it's hard to find the podcast the last few days. I'm not, we're going to have to get that sorted out. I, I, I feel like I, I try my best to like push this thing in everybody's face. Get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals uh, with Panopsi Security. Here's the TLDR, guys. Panopsi.com, link in the description below. 
if you are responsible for information security and you don't know, like just being honest with yourself, it's right. There's nothing wrong here. People learn at different levels. People have different experiences. If you're in charge of information security and you're not completely confident in what you're doing or the direction you're taking the program, maybe you were a network engineer and you got straddled with InfoSec and you, you know, you do good work, but you don't know how to build a comprehensive, uh, maturable program. Uh, maybe you got hired as a one person team for InfoSec and you're doing training, you're doing GRC, you're trying to evaluate MDRs, you're not sure what to do. Panopsi Security, that's what they can do. They can come in, basically give you the guidance and insight that you need, and then touch base with you along the way and make you have a program and have something maturable. And most importantly, have something that's easy to communicate to the business leaders so you can get that. Yes, Randy, thank you. Also, shout out, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> shout out to Anti Siphon Training, but more about them at the mid roll when we do the Tidbits Tuesday. Remember, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth half a CPE, so don't be shy. Say what's up in chat, hashtag team live. Uh, yeah, hey, BSEC, uh, random choices, random roles we're picking here. Hey, uh, hashtag team live in chat. Take a screen cap. Each episode's worth half a CPE. It stacks two and a half a week, 10 a month. Just get a folder on your desktop, a directory if you're a Linux person, and just file those screenshots in there. And then when you're ready to... Um, basically file CPEs. You just count the number of screenshots you got, multiply that by 0.5, file it. And if you get audited, you just got, you got what you need. No big deal there. Okay. We do have, uh, if you are on team replay, hashtag team replay in the comments, the CPEs count just the same for team replay as they do for live. So don't be, don't be thinking you missed out on some CPE, CPE action. Cause you live in Hawaii. Now I want to say a couple things. One, it is a Tuesday, so I'm going to be ripping through this. No jaw jacking. Got the Citadel, uh, where I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Also, Francis Stocktail getting the Sec Plus. Francis? Yes, 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 Francis. Way to go, everybody. Cheers. Coffee cup cheers to Francis. Well done, Francis. All right, y'all. Check this out. If it is your first time on the show here, hashtag first time in chat. I know many of you um, are regulars, are long timers. I saw TJ Zimmer post a, um, a, a squad member uh, milestone. Wow. Love it. Thank you so much, TJ. But if it's your first time here, holler at us with a hashtag first timer. You Listen, if, if you don't like what we're doing here, that's no problem. There's plenty of opportunity for getting content like this in other places. And nope, nope. Like this, this environment is supportive and inclusive. And if it's not for you, that's fine. Like we'll support, <laughs> we'll support you wanting to find this content somewhere else. So no worries. But if it is your first time here, we love to welcome our first timers. I even have a special sound effect for you if it is your first time. Now, do me a favor. We got 20 seconds. I'm going to refill my coffee cup. Someone on LinkedIn that's unknown is a first timer. So to that unknown person who just said hashtag first time. I hope you heard that. Welcome to the party, pal. Do me a favor. Get your coffee. Sit back. Relax. Ellery, Ellery Dora, sit back and relax and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us all in an awesome wave. See you at the mid-roll. From the it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Tuesday, October 10th, 2023. Hacktivist attacks abound in the Middle East. According to the Register, at least 15 known ransomware groups, quote, have announced their active participation in disruptive attacks targeting institutions in Israel and Palestine, as well as their supporters, end quote. These include Anonymous Sudan and Killnet, both of whom will be focusing on targets in Israel, with Killnet stating such on its Telegram channel. A handful of groups from India have announced similar intentions, with at least one claiming a successful attack on the Palestinian government website, according to its own post on Twitter slash X. Damn. Okay. According to Security Week, quoting cybersecurity consultant and OSINT enthusiast Julian Botham, quote, the first hacktivist attack. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. They, they kind of like ran into that second story a little too quick. All right. So two things really quickly. Ken McDonald, first time. Welcome to the party, pal. All right. And also Shakita Coulter been signing on, but never announced yourself. Well, uh, Shakita, I'm very happy that you decided to step into the chat. Welcome to the party, pal. 
Shaquita has entered the chat. All right, guys. So check it out. We're talking about this situation in Israel. If you missed it this weekend, um, basically Palestine Hamas launched like 2,200 rockets into Israel. Uh, if you have family or loved ones or anyone in Israel, um, you know, I, I wish the very best for them. War is hideous and ugly. Um, yeah, war is hideous and ugly. Now, a couple of things. Um, you got to remember, uh, well, there's two things going on here. One, a conflict is a conflict, right? So it, Hamas versus Israel, Palestine versus Israel, um, Russia versus Ukraine. But because there is this like, you know, power struggle or whatever, other, uh, you know, orbital tangential organizations are want to get involved, right? As, as I see it listed in chat right now, a political holy war. Okay. So a couple of things going on here. One, you could have expected this to happen. Israel and, and Palestine have been battling for a while, but as we become more interconnected, more geopolitically in, intermingled, um, you know, you don't want uh, someone that's your ally to disappear because then you lose power, right? Like just, just to put it plainly, right? U.S. and Israel are definitely closely aligned. They've done many military operations together. They share intel. If Israel is under attack, right, that's like your, you know, like your guard on a football line and the tackle next to you is getting, you know, eye gouged and stuff. You're going to do something about it, right? You're going to defend them. You're going to help them because you don't want your tackle getting eye gouged. Kind of similar here. Now, what's interesting is because remember this guys really quickly. Okay. And again, I don't prepare for these stories. So if this is like out, out of the, out of the, you know, out of the uh, realm of reason, let me know, but I will preface this with my asterisk, which essentially if you're a first timer here, like Ken McDonald, um, the, 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 uh, the tinfoil hat, Jerry is a preface to say that, that that's an asterisk. Listen to this for a second. Um, Right now, there is NATO, right? So like Five Eyes and NATO and the G7 summit, right? There's these like Western philosophy countries. The United States is one, Israel, uh, like Germany, that, that are like boys, right? Like we're like, yeah, what's up? We support each other. And we all have kind of the same philosophical idea for like society and mankind. Well, then there's this also this like rising faction called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa and uh, what's the what's the C? Brazil, Russia, India. Oh, China. Pfft, Jesus. Hello. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So hello. Um. So anyways. So to see Russia and India kind of launching attacks effectively against Israel, even though Palestine Hamas is not part of that BRICS faction, it's like you know. Oh, I don't. I don't like you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of situation. You feel me? So, so, uh, I, I see what that is. Now, one thing that I will point out, Israel is a unbelievable first world cyber power, like borderline zero, zero world cyber power. Okay. Like Israel is legit when it comes to cyber, right? US is very, very good. Of course, China is very, very good. Russia's got some folks, but Israel, like a lot of cyber tech that comes out and is like mainstream is Israel, Israel based knowledge going into it. So when you start a digital war, and again, I know Hamas launched kinetic rockets into Israel. So like, let's not over overlook that, but for these threat actors, they're doing a a, a cyber attack, right? Kilnut is known for de uh, denial of service attacks. Anonymous Sudan, known for denial of service attacks. You can't really defend that so much, but I can totally see uh, Israel being able to A, respond uh, quite effectively to some of these attacks and B, um, kind of defend. Now, I also want to point out that the naming convention here is Microsoft naming convention. So if you see uh, threat actors and APTs associated with like, weather kind of things. So storm, blizzard, sandstorm, typhoon, sleet, tsunami, tempest, and flood. These are Microsoft's naming conventions. Microsoft has come like, you know, like from the top rope or like, you know, the, the Royal Rumble and they rang the bell for the next wrestler to come in. And like Microsoft is just hauling butt as fast as they can, ultimate warrior style to the ring um, with the way that they're presenting APTs. Cause like I see it all the time now. 
Um, we're going to have to keep an eye on this. Obviously, the United States has already pledged its um, alliance and support of Israel as they deal with this. Uh, so this is definitely something to keep an eye on. Like any other conflict, it's the same with Russia and Ukraine. The first, like, the first couple months, right? The first 15 to 30 days and then 30 to 60, there is an A load of activity and and you know and 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 you know fighting and stuff like that, both digital and kinetic. So we'll see where this goes, but keep an eye on this one. Um were launched against Israel by anonymous Sudan less than one hour after the first rockets were fired by Hamas. The group targeted emergency warning systems, claiming to have taken down alerting applications in Israel. The Jerusalem Post, the largest English-language daily newspaper in Israel, was also targeted by anonymous Sudan. Oh, okay. Quote. Yeah, the I... power grid named is. All right, so I, I'm. I guess I got it messed up. They're spending a lot of time on this one story, so let's just finish what they're saying and go with it. Israel independent system operator apparently had its network compromised and its website shut down by a group that also targeted the Israel Electric Corporation. A pro-Israel group called ThreatSec claims to have compromised the infrastructure of Gaza-based ISP Alphanet. Journalists caution that claims on social media are often exaggerated to further the cause of the groups. Network protocol open source tool Curl faces worst security flaw in a long time. <coughs> Curl, the open source tool that supports network protocols including SSL, TLS, HTTP, FTP, and SMTP with tasks such as interfacing with APIs and downloading files, is facing two significant vulnerabilities. An advisory from GitHub published Wednesday announces fixes for a high-severity vulnerability tracked as CVE 2023-38545 that will be released tomorrow, October 11th. Oh, my God. All right. So for those who are saying that my my the, the video and audio is out of sync, let me know if covering my, my face up makes the experience better. Uh, because then you can't see me out of sync with the audio. But I believe, believe me, in reality, I'm over here not out of sync with myself. Um, so curl, I did a. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to hold my hand up here very long, y'all. Um, so listen really quickly. I just did a video yesterday, World of Haiku, where um, I like I went into depth about like what curl is and how curl works and showed curl and all these other curl things. Curl has been around forever. Curl is like it's like ping, right? Like you just kind of use it to do things really quickly. Um, so it's been around a long time. It's integrated in a lot. I never knew it was like built into other tools as like a support tool for, for doing these other things. But that's interesting. I always, you, you know, just call curl out as curl, um, you know, directly on the line. But um, let's take a look at this. It looks like they're not releasing any information on the vulnerability, especially the high one. Um, we're getting the release cycle short and release curl 8.4. All right. Um, the good news is it's not going to impact any API calls. Okay, so the hand's more, re more distracting. All right, so let's go. Let's go. You have taken my father. Now you will feel the wrath of cyber hands. <laughs> All right. I guess I'll just be Kung Fu, um, old Kung Fu movie Jerry right now. Um, there isn't much information here. Like basically, Curl's got a problem and no one's talking about what Curl has the problem with. So just keep an eye on it. This is another one of those software supply chain issues where Curl might be baked into something and we don't know what it is. Um, so like when the story actually drops, then we'll get more information. But right now, to me, it's just more interesting because Curl is so well known, so well revered and loved uh, in our in our society, or like you know, in our community, basically. Like everyone knows Curl. Come on, Curl, get in here, buddy. Yeah, Curl using APIs. So the good news is it doesn't affect any APIs, which is great because if you've written a lot of like custom Python and stuff, you're going to be you know, sad. Um, you're going to be sad if you know. You know, you're going to say to the curl APIs. Catch me outside. How about that? <laughs> Catch me outside. I I will find any excuse to play that. GitHub maintainer described this vulnerability as quote probably the worst curl security flaw in a long time end quote, but refused to disclose further details. 
Okay. Okay. Well, hey, words have meaning. The worst curl flaw in a long time. I don't know. I guess I don't subscribe to the curl security flaw Twitter account, but like I, it's first curl issues I've heard. Lisa Bishoping, the director of Endpoint Security Research at Tanium, said, quote, organizations should take advantage of the advance heads up to begin scoping their environment, end quote. She continued, quote, given the advance notice from the lead developer himself and the widespread impact it could have, it would be prudent to plan for a significant event, even if the actual impact ends up being less severe, end quote. Okay, so really quick, here's the TLDR. In my opinion, if you work at a software company or you do like CI, CD, DevOps, somehow web apps are involved um, in your solution, which many are, right? If you're a cloud-based SaaS uh, solution provider, throw this over the fence to your dev team and say, hey, I don't know if y'all are using curl, but this is kind of a thing you might want to uh, be aware of. It could be coming down the pike as a big issue. Uh, IT dev people should know what curl is. Some junior devs might not know what curl is, but anyone, literally anyone who has spent a minute in Linux should know what curl is. Um, and by the way, it takes like 15 seconds to explain to someone what curl is. So um, there's a, it's, it's an easy on-ramp to educating people on what's up. Uh, but you as an infosec professional are not going to be able to find where curl is. You can't run like an Nmap scan and, and like, it's like, oh, curls in this binary curls in this script over here. Right. I mean, you could do a grep and yes, you could find curl in a script, but my point is this is why GRC and I love myself GRC. This is why GRC is important because you need relationships with the business. You need those open lines of communication. So when you do fire this over the fence to the dev team, they don't just delete your email because they think it's another freaking October Cybersecurity Awareness Month message, right? They're like, oh my God, with this guy again. No, you're like, hey, what's up, Todd? Saw this weird curl thing coming across the wire. Could impact us. Sniff it. Give it a sniff, my man. Right? And then they're like, oh, Jerry's always sending over the good stuff because he vets it for us and doesn't just fire over stuff that doesn't really matter, right? This is what we do. This is how we do it. Do, 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 do. Hello Kitty ransomware source code leaked on hacking forum. The full source code for the first version of the Hello Kitty ransomware encryptor has been leaked on a Russian speaking hacking forum by a developer who claims to be building a better, stronger one. The threat actor, who is known by the names Gooky, <coughs> G-O-O-K-E-E, -E, and Cappuccino, spelt with a K, is believed to be the developer of the Hello Kitty ransomware and is now quoted as saying, we are preparing a new product much more interesting than Lockbit. The group behind Hello Kitty ransomware is known for a range of ransomware and encryption attacks, including the 2021 Linux variant that targeted the VMware ESXi virtual machine platform. All right. <clears throat> So here's another um, here's another um, ransomware variant. It's called Hello Kitty. If I was a threat actor, okay. If I was Flaming Donkey, right? And if you're new here, we created our own APT that we're slowly trying to bake in to. Um, <laughs> we're slowly trying to bake into miter attack that's not real. This is Flaming Donkey right here on the right corner. You can see. So if, if we were, if Flaming Donkey really wanted to get on the map, dude, create a ransomware variant with a name that's like super marketable, right? Like call it, um, I don't know, like, like I don't know, Snooky, right? Or, or uh, Real World or, you know, like MTV Road Rules ransomware. Like just who gives a crap, right? You're not going to get hit with like a copyright strike or trademark violation. You're a criminal. Go for it, right? Lord of the Rings ransomware. Right, maybe catch the new Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime Day ransomware. Right, we hit you four times a year. October tenth, we're coming. Right, like whatever, just jump on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, anyways, that's like an aside. Second of all, um, the source code leaked somehow. I don't know why the source code leaked, but it is C plus plus. You can see threat actors um, not really being friends to each other by letting the source code leak. Um, I do want to point out if the threat actor that was behind some, you know, successful uh, gooky uh, ransomware variant is now uh, writing Hello Kitty, they're probably 
it's probably going to be effective. The, the one problem I would point out here is that if C++ is a compiled uh, binary, right? So in the world of software development, this is like a quick little aside. So let me, the more you know, here we go. Where's the more you know? Doo, doo, doo. We have an emote for that. In the world of software development, there's a couple different types of softwares, right? There's compiled softwares, which you take the source code and run it through a compiler. And then you get like an output that's machine readable, but you can't really uh, reverse it. You can use something like IDA um, or Binary Ninja to kind of reverse it, disassemble it. But it, you know, it's not perfect uh, because a compiler will rewrite your code to be like more efficient, more optimized, all these things, um, which makes malware analysis hard. So that's compiled. There's interpreted programs. And this is like what you think of with like scripts, like PowerShell, JavaScript, Python, where the code is not compiled. So reversing the bind or reversing the malware is simple, but this is why criminals use obfuscation techniques to make the functions wicked hard to read and a super pain in the A to analyze. And then there's like logic programs and there's, um, oh my God, uh, like Lisp. I can't even think there's, there's like another programming language paradigm that I think Lisp falls into. I forget. This is like taking me back to my sophomore year of my undergrad. Anyways, this right here is C++, which is a compiled language. So what this means is if the source code has leaked, this means malware analysts, good guys, security researchers, they can all look at this code and easily identify where it's weak, how to exploit it, how to generate keys, etc. So Getting the leak of oh also how to detune, how to tune detections to find these things when we're talking about David Bianco's pyramid of pain getting the source code to the malware that's pretty high to the top of the um, pyramid I think that's like the second tier so this isn't good for Hello Kitty I'd be kind of pissed on if honestly sorry Kennedy if I was a threat actor because like you, you know you're sitting there hammering code out and then all of a sudden the code dumps and now you're going to be less effective. Hello for the good guys. Um, yeah, exactly. Josh Mason talking about uh, PowerShell and VBA are powerful uh, because basically you have all the uh, <laughs> you have all the system libraries and dependencies native on a Windows box already. Angular, thank you. Procedural language. I forgot. It's been a minute, guys. I was a software developer for a hot minute, but um. That's for a story for another time. And now a word from our sponsor, <laughs> Hyperproof. Imagine you have an audit coming up, but instead of the usual rush, you actually feel prepared. You've collected your evidence. You can see which risks have been mitigated. And best of all, you don't have to send out any last minute emails to other teams begging them for that one screenshot. Sounds like a dream, right? With Hyperproof's risk and compliance platform, this could be your reality. Get a demo at hyperproof.io. That's H Y P E R P R O O F dot I O. All right, guys, it is the mid roll, which means one thing. All right. Try to bring the uh, audio down a little bit so I can talk over it. Guys, I want to tell you really quickly thank you all so very much for being here. We're right at 829. Guys, I tell you, when I hit at the mid the mid part of the show at the mid part of the uh, hour, it it does touch me in a in a special way. Like I just it just for me it's like oh it hits just right because it's like executing procedurally right on schedule, like like a train that leaves the station right when it's supposed to. That this is like a bonus tidbits Tuesday. I just love it, and every time it happens, it's like a solid high five. Okay, so thank you all so very much for being here. Thanks to Barricade Cyber. Thanks to Panopsi Security. And thanks to Anti-Siphon Training. Guys, Anti-Siphon Training is here to disrupt the traditional training industry by providing high-quality, cutting-edge education to everyone, regardless of their financial position. John Strand, the entire team at Black Hills Information Security, they are delivering practical, engaging, useful cybersecurity skills by practitioners it's amazing. Use the link in the description below. At a minimum, you get the link bookmark it. At a minimum, bookmark it. Don't do yourself a disservice by not knowing about this resource. Once you go there, go to training, go to pay what you can training. Look at all these courses. They got the calendar right here. 
for free if you want. Whatever you want to pay, including zero. Dude, package of coding with Chris Brenton. Why not? CISSP um, um, practice. Evil container security. You want to learn Kubernetes and how to break it? Why not? On November 1st, giddy up in here. Pay what you can. Guys, API testing, I'll sign up for that November 28th. Unfortunately, I think that's the Friday after Thanksgiving and I'm on travel for family. But you get my point. Don't sleep on this information. Now, really quick, let me tell you who I really appreciate, okay? Turn the light up a little bit. Look, hold on, Jerry, focus. Let me tell you who I really appreciate. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Back there in the left, I appreciate you. I appreciate the mod team. I appreciate the long timers, the first timers, all of you. Guys, I don't tell you often enough. I feel like I do tell you often, but I don't feel it's often enough. Thank you for being part of the community. I This community is bigger than me. It I, It's grown all by itself. You guys are delivering value into the network. You guys are helping each other, supportive, inclusive. We're doing amazing things. Thank you so much for all you do and thank you for the opportunity to allow me to focus even more time energy and resources on supporting our community if you are getting value from the stream educational entertainment do me a favor hit the like button it'll allow other people to find the stream we can grow the community we can help more people but hit the like button and that's how you can do it guys the simply cyber community challenge is an awesome awesome opportunity uh angular has the community baton right now. And I know Angular is in chat because he told me about the procedural language. Angular, do me a favor. Tag somebody with the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Here's what we do, guys. If you want to supercharge and hack your LinkedIn feed to be supportive, inclusive, and awesome content with a big network, this is what you do. Go on LinkedIn, search for this hashtag, connect with the people using it, comment on their posts, connect with the people in the comments. Simple as that. I'll say it again. Go on LinkedIn, find this hashtag, connect with the people posting it, comment on the post, connect with the commenters. Two weeks time, I guarantee you, your network on LinkedIn will be uh, much larger. It'll be full of meaningful connections and not spam bot accounts, trying to offer you certs or take your exams and stuff. And you'll find out about more resources. Your feed will actually be valuable beyond you know ads and crap like that. So giddy up, Simply Cyber Community Challenge, Angular, please tag someone. All right, guys, Tidbits Tuesday. Let me tell you this really quickly. I went on travel this past uh, weekend, and I drove through upstate South Carolina, and I stopped. My buddy told me, okay, really quickly, Tidbits Tuesday is where I spend like 30 seconds telling you something about me. So, you know, see if we resonate or whatever. It's just fun. I, I went through the upstate of South Carolina, and my buddy said, hey, if you get a chance, you should stop at this place called Bucky's. It's it's cool. They have a wall of beef jerky. They make like sandwiches all the time. It's like really, really cool. You got to see it. I'm like, all right. So like driving down the street and it says like Bucky's 20 miles. And uh, the person I was traveling with was like, hey, I really got to use the bathroom. Like maybe uh, we could stop at Bucky's. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Like high five. Let's do it. Holy Jesus. Listen, I don't know if it was because it was lunchtime. I don't know if it was because it was a Sunday. I don't know. You would think Sunday in the South is like slower because people are in church. But oh my God, guys, if you haven't been to a Bucky's, it, it's like going to Six Flags to use the bathroom. You pull over, you're in like a line of traffic. It is moving efficiently, which I do appreciate. But when you walk in, I'm having PTSD just thinking about this. When you walk in, they're like, welcome to Bucky's. Welcome to Bucky's. Like they're, they're just like assaulting you verbally. And the, 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 the juxtaposition of them saying something really nice to you, like welcoming you into the store, like we welcome first timers. They're like, well, like it's like, hey, welcome to Bucky's. But instead, it's it's conflicted because they're like assaulting you verbally. They're like, welcome to Bucky's. And like, I didn't acknowledge the woman saying it to me. So she started screaming it like at my head louder. And like I was in a sea of humanity. I saw the beef jerky. I couldn't even stop because I was like in a stream of humans. Like there was like there was like a craft beer a cooler I wanted to look at, but I I was like I was like having an anxiety attack. I'm like I gotta get the hell out of here. I didn't even go out the same door I came in. I just found an exit and then I walked around the parking lot. Holy jeez! So TLDR, if you get a chance, <laughs> if you get a chance, go to Bucky's, but be prepared. Be pre have hey listen, bring a buddy, have a backup plan, um, and, and have like an escape route, like a fire drill, like you know 
just thinking about it. Oh my god. Welcome to Bucky's. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh. All right. Oh my god. Uh, I might need a minute. Woo. Welcome to Bucky's. Citrix Netscaler login page is hacked. Credentials stolen. A large-scale campaign is underway that is exploiting a flaw in Citrix Netscaler gateways to steal user credentials. This relates to a critical unauthenticated remote code execution bug that was discovered as a zero day in July and is now tracked as CVE 2023-3519. It is impacting Citrix Netscaler ADC and Netscaler Gateway. IBM's X-Force, quoted by Bleeping Computer, reports that despite the multiple warnings to update Citrix devices, the attack surface remains significant and hackers began exploiting it in September to inject JavaScript to harvest login credentials. Although most victims are currently U.S.-based, the attacks cover countries on all continents. All right, uh, hold on a second. Oh, yeah, this isn't good. All right, so a couple things here. Um, Ooh, multiple infographs. If you know me, you know I like my infographics, okay? So this is a big deal, okay? First of all, listen, uh, th this is a big deal, okay? So if you are running Nitri Nitrix, <laughs> if you're running Nitrix Setscaler, if you're running Citrix Netscaler, which many people are, okay? They are internet facing. You've got, like, which means threat actors can get it. This is a rem uh, an unauthenticated. Uh, attack, which means um, it's, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier for threat actors to exploit. And basically what they're doing is they're adding a piece of Java or PHP to web page on the uh, inter internet facing console, basically, to steal your credentials. So uh, let's pick someone. Luke Canfield logs into Netscaler and is able to access resources and Luke Canfield's just off and running. No big deal. However, Luke Canfield's credentials are also captured and sent to the threat actors. Threat actors can now turn around and log into Netscaler as Luke Canfield. So if you have multi-factor authentication, that's going to stop this. Unless, unless the threat actors are really clever and they're capturing the one-time password as quickly as you're entering it. And then they're also authenticating it. So that's not a silver bullet, but multi-factor is going to go a long way to help you here. Also, conditional access, geofencing, uh, impossible travel. So Luke Canfield logs in from Illinois and then immediately logs in from Cambodia. That's a problem, right? You should be able to detect that. Um, if Luke Canfield's credentials are being reused, both for um, corporate access for the Citrix Netscaler and also for like his email, that's a problem, right? You don't want to do password reuse. Um, you could see that they're backdooring, at, you know, at least 600 Citrix servers. They're using a, um, a web shell basically to upload into it. A web shell gives them like kind of quick and dirty access. Uh, the final thing I'll say is two things. One, um, definitely share this one with your IT, um, counterparts. All right. Th this, this particular story has real actionable Intel on it. Share this with your IT counterparts, first of all. Second of all, you want to, obviously you want multi-factor, but um, from an indicators of compromise perspective, you definitely want to check these servers to see, A, are they vulnerable to this particular CVE? And then secondly, it sounds like the threat actors do have to install a web shell um, in the Netscaler um, NS GUI VPN directory, which you'll be able to see, right? Like, Look like watch this directory for new file ads. You'll see the web shell show up. Also, they edit um, the NS comp file or the index HTML file. So again, you can very easily um, either you know take a file hash of this or watch the file for modifications and file integrity changes, right? So there's a couple ways to check the, these things out. Um, you can see here that in the workflow, um, the threat actor. Uh, basically adds the exploit to the um to the uh the web page they add the little web shell here's the php web shell over here then they run um the comp file like basically they cat out the comp file 
and they add their um, little uh, dom attacker domain and JavaScript thing. So final thing, because they do have to reach out, you can see, right? I don't know if you can see it on the stream, but like it says attacker domain because of this, they're not actually writing the credential harvesting JavaScript file to the HTML, HTML file. Um, they're reaching out to a C2 domain and pulling it down. They are editing the index.html file, but they're pulling from their own domain. So if that domain gets blocked um, in DNS or airwalls, that will certainly help protect you. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to stop this and prevent it. Uh, but just know that a victim, Luke Canfield in this case, your end users, your Carls, they're not going to see the problem. Like an end user is going to be able to log in and keep doing their job. They're not going to notice the problem. They're not going to know their creds just got cracked. So, you know, be, be aware of that as well. Okay. Not, not everything is like a movie where like terminal shells just pop up and run. And then like the Pac-Man eats the screen. Like this one completely invisible to an end user victim. Power and data transmission manufacturer <laughs> Volex downplays cyber incident. The UK-based company spelled V-O-L-E-X. Oh, hey, you know what? Really quickly, this is worth stopping the um, this is worth stopping the story. BSEC in chat actually dropped a really good piece of advice. You should also consider sharing this uh, story with your company partners. Um, a lot of businesses will use Citrix NetScaler to allow access to third-party companies, right? Like in a controlled way to allow remote access to backend infrastructure. If if you're doing that, when uh, when you're logging in with your credentials into a third party, you don't want your end users' creds to get popped because some other third party isn't doing their job. So worth sharing. A cyber incident on Monday, October 2nd, that resulted in, quote, unauthorized access to certain IT systems and data, end quote. The company is a manufacturer of critical power and data transmission products. The company said in a statement that, quote, actions taken to date have ensured that all sites remain operational and any financial impact resulting from the incident is not expected to be material, end quote. Android. All right. Well, this is kind of a obscure deep cut story <laughs> okay uh but we are um international we are supportive and inclusive so volex company i've never heard of before um has had a cyber incident they are a manufacturer critical power and data transmission products in bassing stoke england so for our english folks out there for people who like to drink warm beer or you know pip pip and cheerio uh, I don't know. I mean, this is like such a nothing story. Okay. I'm, like, I'm sorry, Volex. So manufacturing company has a cyber incident. Um, it doesn't even say ransomware. It's just like some in like unauthorized access to systems data. And it looks like they thwarted the, the attack. Minimal disruption, immaterial impact. Like what's the story here? Like, dude, <laughs> It's a Tuesday. Like, oh, I saw I saw probing in my net logs. Like, like stop the presses. Um, so sorry, Volex, no, no disrespect, but like, I guess you know what? Sometimes companies do it right. So it isn't all doom and gloom all the time. But like, I mean, this story, yawn. You know what I mean? Devices shipped with bad box firmware. Bad box refers to a global network of consumer products that have firmware backdoors installed and which are sold through a compromised hardware supply chain. To be specific, this is at least 74,000 Android-based mobile phones, tablets, and connected TV boxes, some of which have been found on public school networks throughout the U.S. This firmware backdoor is based on Triada malware, which was found on modified versions of WhatsApp for Android in August and which has been around since 2016. According to a report published by the security firm Human Security, quote, <coughs> bad box infected devices are deemed unsalvageable by an average user, end quote. All right, so this is not good. Um, let me really quickly, like, it'd be nice to know how to detect this. The only way to remove the threat is to wipe the smartphone, reinstall the OS. I feel like you're not doing, like, the story said that, like, they advise that a normal end user can't do this. Like, okay, oh! I'm fine. Maybe Carl can't wipe the OS, but like, let's not, let's not downplay 
normal people. I mean, come on, like re-imaging a mobile device in 2023 is not that tough. Um, how do you find this stuff? That's what I want to know. Like, what's the indicators of compromise? All right. So it doesn't really say how to detect if it is there. Here's the deal. This is kind of crappy. Um, again, I don't want to, I'm not like here to bash China, but this has been the concern for years um, that because China does a lot of manufacturing, that they're baking in malware, they're baking in back doors. Um, again, famously unfounded, but um, this story a few years ago, made a couple bucks off this too, by the way. Big hack, right? There was like this big story that dropped. Bloomberg never refuted it. Most people in our industry did refute it, saying that Supermicro, which is a, a company that makes uh, motherboards, but it's mostly used in like data centers, was putting hardware backdoors on the motherboards before shipping them out to customers like Apple, Amazon, Google, right? And it was like, oh my God, like China's infiltrated like the bottom of the cloud stack, like the calls coming from inside the house. And it never really materialized, but there's always been like whispers of um, China doing these things. Because basically, instead of infecting you, right? Instead of going through all this effort right here with all the um, net scalar infections and all this other crap, right? If they can just bake it in to the original device, then you're infected from Jump Street and it doesn't matter. There's 70,000 Android devices that are compromised. We don't know which ones. They said that they've detected some in schools, which sucks. Again, Android operating system is a popular option because it's cheap. And cheap means that you can buy more of it. Or if you have limited budget, like you're a school, you're a municipality, you're a third world country, you know, you're whatever. So um, this this malware, I mean, frankly, has key logging, eavesdropping, C2. I think it can pull down additional payloads. It's not reserved for mobile devices only. You can see they've got like a laptop. They've got these pucks, like whatever whatever these devices do. So yeah, it sucks. Um, again, like this is really interesting. But me personally, because I'm a cybersecurity professional, like I can look at this story and take a measured evaluation of how bad it sucks. But when you, listen, this is just like a pro tip in general. When you talk to end users, like when you give a talk for non-cyber people, like you can't, to me, to me, this is a philosophical position. You can't just like scare the crap out of them and then like leave, leave it hanging, right? Like we're not in the business of selling fear, uncertainty, and doubt. What you need to do is tell them, whoops, tell them this story but then you have to give them some type of way to fix it. You need to give them a salve in order to soothe themselves. Otherwise, you're just kind of an a-hole scaring people like, ooh, bo the boogeyman, bleh, right? Like, no, like, okay, like with the Citrix Netscaler, okay? Like, this is really bad, but multi-factor authentication, don't use passwords, look for the comp file to be edited, look for the C2 domain of the attacker domain in your net logs. Like there is some way for you to do something about the bad. This, again, like, because I know what I'm talking about, like this doesn't scare me. It sucks, but it doesn't scare me. But you can't, if you just go to your end users and fire out an email and say, hey, your Android device might be infected with malware at the root level, have a great Tuesday. That's not good. That's not good. And by the way, if you're just walking around sowing seeds of uncertainty and doubt, no one's going to want to listen to you because you're a wet blanket, right? You're sand in my beach shorts. Like every time you walk into the break room, it's like like Debbie Downer from SNL. You're like, hey, did you know your creds are compromised? Wah, wah, wah. No, like you have to be able to provide some way to soothe the, the, the end user. Again, because they don't know. They just see Hollywood. All right. All right. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for attending my TED talk. Social media is the golden goose for scammers. That's the title of a spotlight <coughs> report published last Friday by the Federal Trade Commission that says that between January 2021 and June 2023, losses reported from scams that started on social media is at least $2.7 billion. But that number excludes reports that did not specify a contact method. Thus, the number may be much higher. 
The report shows that social media exceeds the costs of scams from websites, phone calls, emails, pop-up ads, and postal mail, and that the amounts lost are higher for younger users. Oh, Fraudulent shopping scams from Facebook or Instagram ads top the list of techniques, followed by investment scams and romance scams. Yep. Over the last. All right. So, I mean, this is great information. The FTC in the United States, the Federal Trade Commission, their entire function is to protect Carl, right? There's Carl. Carl! Their entire job is to protect consumers from predatory lending, Ponzi schemes. Um, Sam Bankman Freed, like basically all that. So like when they release this information, this is good. We've all known that social media is a hotbed because it's easy to like trick people to click on stuff. The social media platforms are more interested in people on platform than they are necessarily protecting them, their people. Hey, Jordan Helton in the house. Where's Jordan? Welcome to the party, pal. Thanks, Jordan Helton. First hashtag first timer. Also shout out to B Panther. B Panther with the community baton. Looking forward to B Panther's Simply Cyber Community Challenge post. Go check that out on LinkedIn. All right. <clears throat> so guys, younger people are more likely to click on it. Surprise. It's not because they're younger. It's because they have less experience and they fall for more stuff. Second of all, romance scams are hot. Investment scams are hot. Online shopping is hot. Yes, yes, yes. Right. We already covered Timu. I'm telling you right now, my Citadel uh, cadets, my my 18 to 20 year old students that I, I teach every Tuesday and Thursday, like later today, they're up on Timu, right? <laughs> so it's nothing for um, someone to set up a big bot account to like offer 50% off for the first hundred people. Click here, compromise, click here, ripped off. Romance scams, people coming out of COVID, you know, they're looking for some love, you know, looking for a little, a little back rub. You know what I mean? A little, a little, a little scratch behind the ear. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a vulnerable population. That's the deal. So personally, I am working on the cyber 101 course. I have an entire module in the course around fraud since I love fraud secretly. It's really not a secret. I tell people all the time. I love fraud, not, not, not committing fraud. But just the art of fraud. It's so it's so clever. It's so smart. It's so like it's so interesting. Um, and and it's deplorable, right? So like, let's not think I'm wearing like an I heart fraud shirt. But uh, it is interesting, and knowledge is power. So understanding how it's done uh, is important, dude. All of the scammer, scammer payback, scammer baiting, all those scammers who like trick older people into clicking on stuff and calling call centers and crap. That's all fraud. That's not malware. They're using a remote desktop application to perpetrate the social of the crime. They're not freaking, you know, next level zero day hackers, right? All right. That's two years. More than half of all organizations security incident and most organizations say they're current. Current SaaS security only covers a part of this comes from perception that security no longer owns SaaS security, seeing themselves transitioning to services. If that's the case, then how do we start addressing the glaring gaps in SaaS security? Hold on. I think that was a commercial. There we go. Hold on one second. Let's do this. All right, guys. What's up? Really quickly while I got you, I'm going to use this story, uh, this FTC story. Uh, just because I mentioned fraud and how much I enjoy it, literally, literally my favorite book of all time is actually a textbook. Um, and it's Joseph Wells' Principles of Fraud Examination. Oh my God. This book, so good. So, so good. I mean, it literally, ha can I show you the front page? Or Oh, I can't click into it. Oh my God. If I had it right with me, I'd show you guys. It literally has like a taxonomy. Um, I, hold on. I want to see if I can see if I can show you this really quickly. It's so good. Oh, there it is. Look at this. Can you see this on screen? Hold on, bro. Like it literally, this is inside the cover. It shows you all it, it, like, dude, here's the best part. People committing fraud they They think they're clever. They think they're creating new forms of fraud. It's all been documented. Fraud's been going on since like people started exchanging money for goods. And 
it's well documented and the, and the book itself has a case study at least one if not multiple for every single one of these types of fraud it's freaking brilliant man it's a, it's not a cheap book and it doesn't read like a page bur uh, turner but it's cool I, I love that book all right guys really quickly i got a couple minutes before the end of the stream if you're interested i i don't do this all the time but i am doing this right now if you'd like to support the channel this is a blog post from Git Guardian about protecting software supply chain. I'm going to drop a link in chat, okay? Um, here we go. Link in chat. If you click on this, if you click on this, I may receive uh, a fee or something like that. If you just click on it and look at the blog post. Uh, if you do click on it, don't feel committed to click on it. I'm not requiring you to click on it. You can enjoy Simply Cyber all day, every day without clicking on this link. But if you do choose to click on it, it will go towards supporting the channel and the efforts that I'm doing here. So um, thank you very much if you choose. I did read this. I do pick blog posts when I do this that I think are valuable. Uh, so software supply chain is a big thing right now. So check that out. Oh, hey, really quickly. Yeah, what's the wrong with having an entire module around romance camps? Kimberly uh, in chat actually just dropped the corporate version <coughs> by Dr. Wells, which is a little bit more affordable. I can't confirm whether or not it has the taxonomy and the case studies, uh, but I will drop a link in here. Thanks so much, Kimberly. Uh, the link, where's the link? Um, where's Who said that? Chris Cahall, it's in the pin chat right at the top. Look on that. Thank you, Maggie, on security. Thanks, Akil George. Appreciate it. All right. No problem. Okay. So, hey, really quickly, if you were here just for the news, I see 345 of you. Thank you so much for being here. Every single weekday morning at 8 a.m., we're doing it one way or another, coming out the gate hot. Sometimes we're 100%. Sometimes we're like 80%. And occasionally, I have a complete meltdown, and we're at like 45%. But we do what we do every single day, and we appreciate that you are here. For the first timers, I hope you come back. Tom Bishop, thanks so much. Yep, going over to uh, uh, train the cadets uh, in about 10 minutes here. Shout out. You guys want to hear something bananas? The Department of Homeland Security's Chief Information Security Officer is guest lecturing my class on Thursday. I have a relationship with him. I don't really talk about it much, but... And uh, it's not romantic. It's like it's like a, a, a network colleague relationship thing. Uh, but he offered to uh, come in and guest lecture. And I feel like my students don't even like understand the gravity of what's going on. But it's pretty cool. I'm super pumped to do that with him on Thursday. Francis Stocktail asks, is the CISSP worth it? Personally, I think it's worth it. Uh, practical skills are in demand right now in our industry. But to me, you know, maybe I'm a little dated. I got my CISSP in 2009. I remember reflecting that I had reached a career milestone. To me, you need five years of C uh, security experience to get CISSP. To me, when I got CISSP, I felt like, yes, I made it to um, my, the middle of my career. I'm no longer junior. I'm like mid-tier. I think it's worth it. It shows up on an A load of job requirements. So it's definitely there. Jenny, uh, Joey Shacken or Joey Chacon, first time on Team Live. I've been Team Replay for the past three months. Well, Joey, welcome to the, welcome to the Team Live party, pal. Thanks for the clarification, Jerry. And I'm, and I'm with your wife. Happy to hear that one. LOL. Yes, thank you, Emmanuel Dark. Guys, the studio is like so close. I think I might, I think I might move. Simply Cyber into the Buffer Osier Flow studio presented by Red Bull on this weekend. Um, again, you got to expect that there's going to be disruptions to everything because, um, <laughs> um, you know, because we're moving into a new studio, but whatever. Um, oh, Jason Bagwell, that's a good point. Maybe I will ask him if he wants to. Uh, we'll see how Thursday goes. If he has a good experience, I'll definitely bring him on. I know. B sex busting my chops in mod chat that I can get the DOD CISO, but not uh, Jen Easterly. Jen Easterly. I do post the replays on Spotify. If you would prefer to consume the Simply Cyber Daily uh, threat briefing, um, 
in audible format, you can get simply cyber. I don't tell people this often. I do it as a community service. I'm not really trying to grow the, the audio podcast, but yeah, you can see it on stream right here. You can absolutely get it on Spotify, <coughs> Apple podcast, uh, all those things, uh, all the places you consume it. So, uh, James McQuiggan, that would be great. Maybe we will do that. You will be in town for a hot minute. Um, oh, oh, um, besides Charleston, I am keynote speaking. Um, if you're coming, come check it out. James McQuiggan is speaking. Very, very cool. I'll answer a couple more questions, but I got to get going to class, guys. The title of the fraud book, Matthew Hossberg, is Principles of Fraud Examination. Um, Principles of Fraud Examination. Now, this is the corporate fraud one. Again, Kimberly provided that in chat. I trust Kimberly, so it's it's probably um, legit, legit, but this is the one I'm talking about. Principles of Fraud Examination. Right here. This book is sick. Joseph Wells. Um, so Raniel says, if you need five years of experience for CISP, why is it in cyber rec jobs? It, that's a good question, Raniel, because um, HR doesn't understand what they're doing. Uh, also, you can like you can be matrix, right? So like BSEC, for example, he's a network engineer, but he does, an at, he does a lot of InfoSec stuff. So he actually has over five years of infosec experience, but he doesn't, he doesn't identify. I, oh, maybe he does now. I don't know. BSEC, but he doesn't identify as like a cybersecurity practitioner. He's a, he's an it guy who's also quite accomplished at cyber. Right. So you can get those five years, but the thing is, once you have the five years, like chances are, you're not going for an entry level position. Uh, we may be doing a live stream from Deadwood or several. We'll see. I I'm, I'm, I, any idea that Josh Mason has, I, I I approach cautiously. Guy's got great ideas. We will be doing live streams. Actually, ACI Learning, um, ACI Learning, um, I, I'm friends with, I'm affiliated with. They're actually setting up a, a whole studio at Deadwood, and they've told me I can use it. I can basically like squat on their studio. Uh, so th it, there will be live streams, okay? That's the TLDR. All right, guys, I got to get out of here. Thank you all so very much. Um, any certs or courses to recommend for newcomers in cyber nomad? It depends on what you want to do. So really quickly, um, at X nomad, um, I, I just dropped a link to the book nomad. Like basically you got to figure out what you want to do first before you choose training and certs. This book, I just posted a link to, I wrote it's 10 steps. Like step four or five will help you figure out what it is you want to do. Once you get that, I can answer that question. Um, I can answer that question. All right, guys, be good. Thank you all so very much for all you do. Great to see Josh Mason and chat. Great to see Kimberly back. Hope everybody's feeling well. Jenny Housley, BSEC, the whole mod team, James McQuiggan, probably somewhere at 35,000 feet. Guys, we'll see you tomorrow at... Um, 8 a.m. Oh, 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 real, real quick, real quick. If you're still part of the 297 here, um, like I haven't scheduled it yet, but just know this. Come on. Uh, this Friday at around 4 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to do a wet run of the Simply CyberCon. It's called a wet run. Uh, it's really like a dry run, but I'm going to have beer. So I'm calling it a wet run. Compliments, I think, of BSEC or Joel Belton, whoever, whoever said it was a wet run. Uh, we're going to test um, the two Zooms, the two live streams, bringing people in and out of Zoom. It's basically like a full-on tech stack test of how we're going to do Simply CyberCon. So if you're a Simply Cyber community member, you want to come uh, help us out, be part of the you know the the group kind of setting this all up. Please come. Uh, I will schedule it when I get a minute. Uh, but just that's just like an FYI. So this Friday afternoon is when it's going down. Be good, everybody. Hey, thanks to everybody who clicked on the link in the uh, mod chat and helping support the show. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jerry, your chat. Until next time, everybody be great and uh, stay secure.
Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply 